Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carrie Grady Vincent, and I am the Senior Manager of Scientific and Clinical Programs at Osteoporosis Canada. I will be your moderator for today's webinar, What You Need to Know About the 2023 Clinical Practice Guideline. Before we begin, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices, located in Toronto, are on as a traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Kreda, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home now to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Kreda. At Osteoporosis Canada, we educate Canadians about bone health, including healthcare professionals and their clients. We are the only national organization serving people who have or are at risk for osteoporosis. We are really excited about today's presentation, which will provide general information about Osteoporosis Canada's new guideline on the management of osteoporosis, focusing on exercise, nutrition, fracture risk assessment, and treatment. It is not intended to provide individualized health advice. If you do have questions about osteoporosis, please consult with your healthcare provider. If you do have questions during this webinar, remember to click the question and answer button on your screen to submit your questions, and we will try to get to as many as we can, time permitting. Before we begin, make sure you have your speakers turned up fully so that you can hear the presentation clearly. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rowena Rideout. Rowena is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of Toronto and a physician at UHN MSH Osteoporosis Program. She has been involved in clinical research in osteoporosis, including the attainment and maintenance of peak bone mass, the treatment of steroid induced osteoporosis in children and interventions in the fracture clinic. She is currently at the chair of the Osteoporosis Canada Scientific Advisory Council, and she has served on many, many committees, including, a, including six years as the medical advisor to COPEN, our patient network. Dr. Rideout is active, actively involved in medical education at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rowena. Dr. Rideout, take it away. I'm sorry, I just gotta get my screen here. So can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see the screen now as I start. Uh, it's yeah, really- we it, Rowena. Pardon? We can see it, it's good. Okay, great. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the clinical practice guideline, um, which everybody has uh, been waiting so anxiously for. Um, sorry, I'm just... So the first thing is obviously just to give you my disclosures, which I really don't have any of other than to let you know I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Osteoporosis Canada. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is give you an overview of the different components of the new guideline. Uh, that involves uh, uh, the area of exercise, nutrition, uh, recommendations on bone density testing and the use of osteoporosis medications, as well as monitoring for patients, for individuals who are on therapy. Um, so the first question is really, what is a clinical practice guideline? Clinical practice guidelines are developed to provide recommendations for healthcare providers about the care of patients with a specific condition, in this case, osteoporosis. They're based on the best available research evidence, uh, expert opinion, and practice experience. And uh, as they are developed, people go through all the currently available medical literature to try and make recommendations. They're used to help uh, healthcare professionals understand how to treat someone with the specified condition. Uh, when you look at clinical practice guidelines, the key components include uh, a piece identifying the key decisions that need to be made and the consequences of these decisions, a review of the relevant valid evidence on the benefits, the risks, and the costs of alternative decisions. And it's also important that they present the evidence in a way that is accessible and meets stakeholder preferences and needs. 
So in terms of background, more than 2 million Canadians live with osteoporosis. Fractures uh, are the clinical consequence of osteoporosis and what we are trying to uh, prevent. And although osteoporosis is commonly thought of as a disease of osteo older women, it's important to understand that one in three fractures actually occur in men. And that men, when they have a fracture, have greater um, morbidity and mortality, in other words, greater consequences of the fracture. And they also suffer higher rates of subsequent fractures after their first fracture. So one of the really important things as these guidelines was developed was to make sure men were included. The question that always comes up is why update the guidelines that we had? Uh, the previous guidelines were developed and, and published in 2010. Um, guidelines in general assist the Canadian healthcare professionals deliver care to optimize skeletal health and prevent fractures in postmenopausal females and males over the age of 50. Since 2010, there have been a number of advances. One of them has been in the area of fracture risk assessment. The second has been in lifestyle management. And finally, uh, there's certainly been changes in how we treat um, osteoporosis with medications. Uh, if you sort of look at what was current in 2010, fracture risk tools, the way we determine somebody's risk of fracture were relatively new. Um, the tool that many of you may have seen used by your uh, healthcare provider, CAROC, uh, was developed in 2005 by Osteoporosis Canada in association with the Canadian Association of Radiologists. And in 2008, the World Health Organization launched FRAX, which is the sort of more worldwide fracture risk assessment tool. Um, in 2010, Canadian data were added to FRAX so that we could use FRAX as well. If you think about medications, uh, denosumab or Prolia was actually only approved in Canada in 2010, so it was very new. And we were just starting to learn about some of the concerning side effects of medications, uh, particularly osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femur fractures. Uh, there's a lot that has changed since 2010. Uh, there's been a lot of research on the fracture risk assessment tools and how to use them. Uh, there's been evidence published on how frequently you should do bone density testing and what the benefits or lack of benefits are of doing it very frequent intervals. Um, there are data, uh, there are new guidelines that have targeted individuals who are considered to be at very high risk of fractures. Several of those have been published over the last 10 years. We've also got new medications available in Canada. Romazosumab, a uh, brand name of vanity, was approved in 2019. Uh, teriparatide, or what may, you may have known as Porteo, uh, there are now three similar medications called biosimilars that were approved in Canada in 2020. And in addition, both uh, teriparatide and zoledronic acid intravenous bisphosphonate have now become generic, so we're more freely available to bull at a lower cost. There's also been increased access to newer therapies in many, although not all provinces. Um, and we have new data on both the risks or harms of medications, such as fractures when you delay a dose of denosumab and more information on atypical femur fractures. So all of this um, is background for what has gone into the new guidelines. If you look at who the guideline is for and what it's intended to do, the target audience is primary care providers and patients in Canada. The population that we're looking at is postmenopausal females and males 50 years and older who have primary osteoporosis. The guideline doesn't address individuals who have secondary causes of osteoporosis, for example, steroid-induced osteoporosis, those on cancer treatment or who have cancer-related osteoporosis, those who have osteoporosis related to specific drugs, uh, such as steroids, but there are other drugs, um, and those who have secondary osteoporosis because it's disease related. And there, there are a number of diseases that can cause osteoporosis. These are just examples, hyperparathyroidism, chronic kidney disease, bowel disease, eating disorders, et cetera. It's not intended to address premenopausal women who have osteoporosis. And we already have put out guidelines on the long-term care population. So it really doesn't address that. And similarly, it doesn't address children. The aim of the guideline is to assist in screening for risk factors for osteoporosis and fractures and to provide interventions to optimize skeletal health and fracture prevention. So when you set up a guideline, it's, it's a lot of work and it took many years to do this. There are a number of uh, committees and working groups that have been involved. Um, 
the, the key point, which I'm gonna come back to is that every committee had a primary uh, care physician on it because the guidelines are intended mostly for primary care physicians. And it also had a patient partner on it. All of these were members of COPING. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. So that both the primary care viewpoint and the patient viewpoint were considered um, throughout all of the work done on the guidelines. Uh, you start with a steering or oversight committee that sort of guides all of the work that goes on. There was also a committee that looked at conflict of interest and ongoing now is the KT or knowledge translation committee, which then tries to um, uh, find ways to put the all the information from the new guideline out into practice for people to be aware of. We also had a stakeholder committee um, that tries to take all the points of view of stakeholders and also sent the guideline out for them to review before it was published. The actual um, sort of details of the guideline came from four working groups, an exercise working group, a nutrition working group, a fracture assessment working group, and a pharmacotherapy working group. And I'm going to show you some of the information that came from each of these when, when we look at the recommendations. Um, uh, all of the patient representatives, as I said, came for COPEN. I just like to highlight COPEN because it's a wonderful resource um, for people with tons of information and free to join, get newsletters, just as a reminder for anybody who doesn't know. So these are all the people who are involved in developing the guidelines. And I've just highlighted in red the uh, patient uh, representative on each of these committees. Um, the people with stars at the beginning are people from whom, whom have very generously given me slides that I'm using in this presentation um, from each of the four working groups. And uh, so many of these slides are not mine and I'm very grateful to all of my colleagues for allowing me to use theirs. So the first piece of the guideline is to identify the questions that should be asked. And this was done in consultation with the stakeholders, the primary care physicians, a questionnaire went out to them asking what their concerns were and what they felt the guidelines should consider. Um, the Scientific Advisory Council, which is experts uh, associated with Osteoporosis Canada were also consulted. And a survey went out to patients uh, via COPEN. So it went out to all COPEN members and more than a thousand individuals responded to that survey, which is really quite incredible. Um, that data was actually published in, in a journal article in 2020. And not only was it published in that article, but uh, Larry Fennell was able to present this at the World Health Organization met meeting, which is an international osteoporosis meeting in 2019. Uh, that's how interested people were in the fact that patients were involved uh, throughout our guideline development. The top questions patients want, wanted asked are listed here. And one of the things you can see, people were very interested in the benefits and harms of medications. And the first knowledge translation tool that has come out of the guidelines effect, in fact addresses that. There is a tool at a decision-making aid to assist uh, people as they think about the starting on medication. This will be available or is available on the website right now. So when you look at research priorities for the guidelines, you're looking at benefits and harms, the benefits of fracture reduction, and you're looking at spine fractures, hip fractures, other fractures, and all fractures. You're looking at mortality. We were also looking at physical functioning and disability, quality of life, and falls. The harms were primarily harms uh, from medications, uh, both uh, sort of the more minor adverse events and the more serious ones, atypical femur fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw. And the final priority was to determine what absolute benefit or risk would be clinically meaningful depending on each outcome. When, when the guideline was completed, there were 25 recommendations, 10 good practice statements and flow charts um, looking at um, both fracture, how to assess fracture risk and to guide therapy. Uh, there are also two appendices that are available that anybody can access on the Canadian Medical Association Journal website. In terms of changes from the 2010 guideline, one is the use of the grade framework, which I'll come back to very briefly. It's how you actually analyze the data and, and make your recommendations. There were expanded recommendations on exercise and nutrients other than calcium and vitamin D. And there were clearer guidelines on how to start treatment, how long to treat for, and how to monitor. 
There's also some new guidelines on when to use anabolic therapy. And I will try and show you all of this as we go through. So first of all is what is GRADE? GRADE is a uh, methodology for evaluating, rec developing recommendations and evaluating data. It helps um, you to consider all of the important criteria as you look at the data on what the benefits of a treatment or test or intervention are. How large are the benefits? How large are the harms? Will what sort of will the cost be? Will it save money in the long term or cost money? Will people find it acceptable to take it or provide it? Will it improve or reduce uh, equitable access to care? And is it feasible to take or provide? And then once you have evaluated all those things, you make a recommendation. It's not simply the benefits and the harms, it incorporates all those criteria and it's a balance. So when you look at how we make recommendations uh, in the guideline, using the GRADE framework, there are two terms that you can use. If your recommendation is strong based on all the data, you say we recommend. And so some of the guidelines I will show you say we recommend, and those are very strong recommendations. This is where the consequences, uh, the desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable ones. Um, and it's generally interpreted to mean most patients would want the recommendation and only a small proportion would not want that course of action. And for clinicians to interpret, most, should receive, most individuals should receive that recommended course of action. If the evidence behind the recommendation is not as strong. We call it a conditional recommendation. And we then say we suggest. This is where the desirable consequences of the recommendation probably outweigh the undesirable ones. And again, we feel most patients would want the suggested course of action, but there are probably a larger number that would not want it. And that clinicians should understand that different choices will be appropriate for each person. And, and there's probably more of a discussion in helping uh, your patient come to a decision about whether or not to take that recommendation. We also have a number of what are called good practice statements. Uh, these are actionable statements that should result in a strong benefit, but they don't have the same amount of data analysis behind them. Uh, they're usually things that are in practice already, um, and many are actually carried over from the 2010 guidelines. For example, um, one of the good practice statements will say that prior to initiating pharmacotherapy, good practice includes assessing for secondary causes of osteoporosis and for potential limitations when you consider specific osteoporosis pharmacotherapy. What that means is that you should do some investigation before you start to treat somebody, but, the, but it's a good practice statement because nobody went back and scoured the literature to determine if there was evidence to support this. It's just considered good practice and everybody does it. So this is just a framework of the um, algorithm for the, for the guideline. I'm going to put in the details as we go through. But basically, you start with postmenopausal women and men over the age of 50. And the first piece is recommendations for exercise and nutrition and supplementation. This is before you even decide if somebody should be screened for with a bone density or not, because these recommendations apply to all individual, all postmenopausal females and males over the age of 50. The next piece is to say you should do a clinical assessment to identify risk factors for osteoporosis, as well as for signs of an undiagnosed vertebral fracture. And I will show you what these risk factors are and how we look for vertebral fractures. Based on that, you will determine whether the individual is at low risk based on their age and lack of risk factors at intermediate risk based on their age and risk factors, or at high risk based purely on their fracture history. And if they're not at low risk, then they will sort of meet the criteria to get a bone density test, and then to determine a more uh, precise fracture risk using that bone density and move on to the next part of this, the um, algorithm, which will then take you down the path of, are they at low risk for fracture, intermediate risk for fracture, or high risk for fracture? If they're low risk for fracture based on the new guidelines, we wouldn't recommend uh, pharmacotherapy. If they're at intermediate risk, um, it would be a suggest recommendation, which means that some individuals who fall into that intermediate risk group will be offered or take pharmacotherapy. Some will not. 
if you fall into the high risk group, then pharmacotherapy would be recommended because there is a much bigger benefit in that group than in the other groups for the effective treatment. And it would be expected that most people who fall into the high risk group would be ultimately treated. When you look at how you follow people up in terms of reassessing with um, bone density or fracture risk assessment, it will depend on what your underlying initial risk is. So to fill in some of these details, let's start with exercise. Um, so the exercise recommendation is to recommend balance and muscle strengthening exercises uh, at least twice weekly for all individuals. So part of this is that balance and functional training twice weekly will reduce the risk of falls. I'm not an exercise professional and I would hate to give you a whole lot of advice on what exercises to do and how, but I can point you in the direction of where to find these. The second recommendation is progressive resistance training also at least twice a week, including exercises targeting abdominal and back extensor muscles. So as a first place, where can you find some of the information on these, on exercises? Um, there are tremendous resources on the osteoporosis website um, all thanks to Dr. Laura Gian Gregorio, who was the um, uh, working group chair for the exercise group. There's a number of videos on exercises, both general exercises for anybody and exercises for people who are at risk for fracture. Um, and I would recommend if you're looking for exercises that this is a great place to start. Um, the other exercise recommendations are that for outside of those recommended exercises for balance and, and resistance training, they would suggest that people who want to participate in other activities for enjoyment or other benefits should be encouraged to do them as long as they can be done safely or can be modified for safety. But these other activities should be encouraged in addition to, not instead of, balance, functioning, and resistance training, because those three are the exercises that are based on the evidence from the literature, the ones that will reduce the risk of fracture. Um, impact exercises need to be progressed um, only if appropriate for your fracture risk or fitness level. And then they do have a good, some good practice statements um, that it, where you have activities that involve rapid, repetitive, sustained weighted or end range of motion, twisting or flexion of the spine, you may need to modify them, especially if you're at high risk of fracture. And when available, um, it's recommended that you seek advice from exercise professionals who have training on osteoporosis for exercise selection, intensity, and progression, especially if you've had a recent fracture or if there's a high risk of fracture. Uh, when these aren't available, these specialized uh, professionals, uh, the Osteoporosis Canada resources on the website can be very helpful. So again, on the website, there are how to do everyday activities safely. These are wonderful videos that are, are very practical and give uh, great advice on uh, how to exercise safely or do exercise, uh, do everyday activities and, and modify them to, to minimize your risk of fracture. Just as an example, people always say don't reach or twist or bend, but you can never avoid doing those activities completely. You may need to try not twisting your spine over and over again quickly or bending forward quickly or combining twisting and bending or do that while holding something heavy. Uh, the other piece is to look at safe movements. Um, bending at the hips and knees rather than rounding the back will probably be a much safer way to do uh, your lifting. Also, if you want to hold, lift, hold things, hold them close to the body or divide the weight evenly in each hand so that you're balancing when you are carrying weights. Log rolling to get out of bed and using your arm strength will be safer than just bounding out of bed quickly. Um, so again, resources are um, uh, available from a National Osteoporosis Society or see an occupational physical therapist if you do have concerns about your spine. So nutrition is the next set of uh, recommendations. Um, these have changed somewhat since uh, the 2010 guidelines. Um, they suggest the recommendation is to eat foods rich in calcium and protein, and they recommend a minimum vitamin D supplement of 400 units a day. So these slides come from uh, Wendy Ward, who chaired the nutrition working group. Um, 
for people consuming a balanced diet and not receiving medical therapy for osteoporosis, supplementing with calcium and vitamin D and protein is likely to have little to no beneficial or detrimental effect on fractures based on all the evidence that in, in the literature currently. So the recommendation is to have a balanced diet um, and eat for bone health foods first, foods that are rich in calcium and vitamin D and protein, as well as looking at things that have magnesium and vitamin K, but a foods first approach with a supplement for vitamin D. Uh, for, for people who meet the recommended dietary allowance of calcium with a variety of calcium rich foods, supplementation is not recommended to prevent fractures. So the recommendations here are based on the uh, Canada Food Guide uh, recommended dietary allowances. For men between 50 and 70, it would be 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. And for over men over 70, it would be 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. For women, uh, and any women over the age of 50, it's 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day with an upper limit of 2,000 milligrams. You can get calcium in a variety of uh, dairy and fortified foods. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful resource on the Osteoporosis Canada website, the Calcium Calculator, which will help you to identify how much calcium you are getting uh, through your diet. Um, this calcul, oops, sorry, I'll come back to that in a minute. For vitamin D, um, very few foods contain vitamin D, and it's not really reliable to re rely on sunlight, particularly as you get to the winter months in Canada. So the recommendation is, um, based on the current recommended dietary allowance, that men and women 51 to 70 get 600 international units of vitamin D, and that people over the age of 70 get 800. Health Canada recommends 400 international units a day as a supplement uh, plus dietary sources as few foods contain vitamin D. Uh, interestingly, now with changes to the fortification, if you drink a glass of milk, you'll get 200 units of calcium, vitamin D in that glass of milk. And anything that is fortified and says that it is fortified with vitamin D has to meet the same levels um, as cow's milk. So it will have 200 units in it. There are much more variable levels in yogurts and cheeses and plant-based foods, but in, in beverages, uh, if they're fortified or, or in cow's milk, you will get 200 units of vitamin D. Uh, fatty fish contains vitamin D, but not much else, and eggs have a little bit of vitamin D. The recommendation for an upper limit of vitamin D consumption through diet and supplements is 4,000 units a day. Most people do not need that much. Um, there are rare situations where people are vitamin D deficient or have difficulty absorbing it, and they may require more, but that would have to be individualized. Um, when it comes to protein recommendations um, and vi vitamin K or magnesium, having looked at the literature, the recommendation is that no additional supplementation is recommended or suggested. Um, it is recommended, however, that uh, people have protein at every meal, mixed sources of protein can be animal or plant sources. And this is uh, following what is in the Canada Food Guide. The recommendations are a little bit different for people who are starting on medication for um, osteoporosis, because in this situation, it's important to individualize calcium and vitamin D um, intake. In most of the drug trials for osteoporosis, uh, participants received a minimum of 400 inter -unit, national units of vitamin D and up to 1,000 milligrams of calcium. Um, so we know that all of the trials uh, encourage, encourage people to have adequate supplementation, and this will need to be individualized according to risk factors um, for insufficiency. For calcium, you can estimate your intake based on your diet, and we recommend people look at the calcium calculator, which is on the OC website, and I'll show you in a minute. For vitamin D, you need to consider the risk factors for insufficiency or deficiency and consider um, supplementing higher or certainly measuring the level to determine if you need to go higher. The calcium calculator on the website is uh, has lots of information. You can plug in any of the foods that you are taking and see how much calcium um, they will provide you with. One of the new tools as part of the new guidelines um, is actually a nutrient calculator, which looks at more than just calcium. Uh, you can plug in what you've eaten over the course of a day, 
and then it will pump out for you not just calcium intake, but also vitamin D, vitamin K, protein, and magnesium. Um, and so you will have all five nutrients over the course of your day. Uh, I think this act is actually available right now to you, and it'll tell you what your intake was and what you need um, for, for all of these nutrients. So that's some, one of the new tools that is coming. There will be more tools coming, but this was the first one that has been developed. So these are the recommendations for diet and exercise. Um, recommend a balance and muscle strengthening exercises, suggesting eating foods rich in calcium and protein, and minimum supplement of 400 international units of vitamin D with a balanced diet, foods first approach, but you may need to individualize this approach and you may need to consult a dietitian. So then let's move on to screening, the bone dense, which is sort of bone density testing, assessing people, determining if they need testing. As you move down um, in this flow chart, the, the, this is now beyond the uh, mauve box into the gray boxes. Perform a clinical assessment to identify risk factors and signs of undiagnosed vertebral fractures. So that is the good first good practice statement in the guideline that you need to assess people uh, for risk factors and the signs of undiagnosed vertebral fractures. So what are the risk factors? Well, obviously a previous fracture after the age of 40, these are low trauma fractures, but not fractures of hands or feet or facial bones. We don't consider those osteoporotic fractures. Um, other risk factors include a pa parent who fractured a hip, um, secondary osteoporosis, uh, and I'll show you very quickly some of the things that are included in that. Current smokers or people who are drinking on average three or more drinks of alcohol a day, as well as the glucocorticoids, prednisone dose um, of at least five milligrams a day. That's actually a change from the previous guideline, which was seven and a half milligrams a day. So anybody who's on chronic steroid therapy for at least three months in the last year, uh, that's a risk factor for osteoporosis. And the final risk factor is low, low body mass index. We, in the 2010 guidelines, it was purely a weight or a weight loss since the age of 25. Now it is a body mass index of less than 20. And the final one, which is also um, new is to specify falls two or more falls in the last year. This is a fairly large list of uh, diseases and drugs that can place people at risk for secondary osteoporosis. And this is things that should be considered as you're doing a risk assessment in an individual. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them all, it includes bowel disease and kidney disease, um, a number of hormone issues, uh, issues with calcium or your thyroid or cortisol, and a number of medications outside of steroids, including um, treat, treatments for uh, breast cancer or prostate cancer, as well as a number of other cancer chemotherapies and immunosuppressant drugs. So the second good practice statement for sort of fracture risk assessment is assessing for vertebral fractures. When you look at this, one of the things we do to assess for vertebral fractures is to look for height loss or to look for a sort of a kyphosis, a curving of the spine. If you look at those three skeletons, the first one um, doesn't have any vertebral fractures. Uh, the spine is relatively straight and there's not a great distance between the back of the head and the wall, less than four centimeters. As somebody starts to develop um, spine fractures, their head moves farther away from, they can't line it up straight and they start to lose height. Then you also start to lose your weight. So that three finger breaths or two finger breaths is, is how much, how many fingers can, can get in the waist between the rib cage and the, the top of the pelvis. So a very quick and easy clinical assessment for vertebral fractures is to look at height loss over time, to look at how far away from the wall somebody can, Put, or is able to put their head or how close to the wall and whether or not they really have much of a waist left. And that's how we recommend a very quick screen for vertebral fractures. So in terms of what the suggestions are for who should get bone density testing, these have changed from the 2010 guidelines. The recommendations based on the data are that anybody who is 50 to 64 years old who has had a previous osteoporosis related fracture 
or who has two or more clinical risk factors, the ones we showed in the previous slides, uh, should get a bone density test. The second group of people, uh, and this is those fractures after the age of 40, uh, excluding the ones I talked about. Or if for individuals who are more than 65 years old who have one clinical risk factor, they should be getting a bone density test. It used to be that anybody 65 and older should be. That age has been up to 70. So if you don't have any clinical risk factors and you are 70 years old, if you've never had a bone density test, you should be getting one at age 70. This is the new guideline recommendations for screening with bone density testing. And that falls in here to fill in the, the algorithm that you can see here. The clinical assessment includes all of those risk factors and the signs of vertebral fracture, either a height loss or a loss of a waist or being sort of having a head that you cannot put close to the wall. And then using those risk factors, if you're 70 and have no risk factors, you should, you, you should not, if you're under 70 and don't have any risk factors, we wouldn't actually recommend at this point getting bone density testing. If you're between 50 and 64 with more than two or more risk factors, if you're 65 to 69 with one risk factor, or if you're 70 or older with no risk factors, you should get a bone density test. Anybody who's had a hip or spine fracture or more than two fractures is considered to be uh, clinically at high risk. Uh, they certainly aren't excluded from getting a bone density test, but they certainly uh, should be going on to the next part of the algorithm. So the next part of the algorithm is to determine what your fracture risk is um, uh, more precisely. We have two tools available to us to do this. The one most of us have been using in Canada is the KROC tool from 2010, which is very simple to use. All you need is the bone density and your fracture history and whether or not you're on prednisone or steroids. And you plug that in and you come up with just three possible answers. You're either low risk if your risk for having a fracture over the next 10 years is estimated to be less than 10%. You're at moderate risk if you fall between 10 and 20% for a fracture over the next 10 years, and high risk if you're more than 20%. The other tool available to us um, requires you to uh, use um, usually a, a, a website to calculate the fracture risk. It's a little bit more complicated because it requires a little bit more data, and that's FRAX, for which we have a Canadian version. Uh, FRAX requires not only your bone density and your history of steroid use and fractures, but also wants your height and weight. Uh, it wants to know about smoking and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other secondary causes of osteoporosis as well as alcohol use. And it comes up with a, a not just a less than 10% or 10 to 20% or greater than 10 to 20%, but an actual number that is the risk for a major osteoporotic fracture over the next 10 years, as well as a hip fracture risk, although we don't use that in the guideline. Um, so this will come up with a number, in this case, 16% for the risk of a major fracture in the next 10 years. Um, which tool is now recommended? Um, in the new guideline, the, the FRAX tool, the Canada-specific FRAX tool, is the preferred tool, although KROC can be used as an alternative tool. Both of these tools predict fractures well, and they agree about 90% of time, the time on your fracture risk. We also know that both can underestimate fracture risk in a number of cases. One, if the bone density is very low at the spine or hip, the total hip. One, if somebody's had a recent fracture because that isn't accounted for in the, in the um, models. Uh, it doesn't really account for people who fall frequently or who have other comorbidities that make them more likely to fracture. Through research, it's been determined that when they don't agree on your fracture risk, overall, it's probably the balance of effects favor FRAX. So FRAX is perhaps a little bit more reliable when they don't agree. As a result, um, based on all of the research, the recommendation is that FRAX is the preferred tool for using to estimate fracture risk. So to come back here, you will uh, get your bone density test, uh, estimate fracture risk, and then look at um, what is recommended in terms of pharmacotherapy. So having calculated the fracture risk using FRAX, the recommendation for initiating pharmacotherapy in, in women or men over the age of 50 is that if you've had a previous hip 
or spine fracture or two or more osteoporosis related fractures, then therapy is recommended. That means that's a strong recommendation. Most people should have it. Or if they, if you, when you do your fracture risk calculating using FRACs, the major osteoporotic fracture risk is more than 20%, greater than or equal to 20%. Or, um, for individuals over the age of 70 who, based on their bone density test, who have a T-score that is below minus or equal to minus 2.5, this is an additional group of people who are going to benefit from treatment, and it's recommended that they have a, they can have osteoporosis therapy initiated as well. The suggest recommendation is for people who are felt to be at intermediate risk of fracture, so a little bit lower risk. And this will involve more of a conversation with a physician and, and not all individuals are going to feel that it's right for them. The suggestion uh, for these people at slightly lower risk is that if somebody has a 10 year major osteoporotic risk factor between 15 and 19.9%, so below 20%, uh, those individuals should be considered for treatment. Or if they're below seven, C and have a T-score of um, more than 2.5. This is how it falls out when you fill in the boxes here. So once you've got your bone density and you calculate your fracture risk, um, if you fall into the low risk group below 15%, or you have a T-score above minus 2.5, the risk of fracture is not high enough to feel there's really benefit from starting on medication. And so treatment is not recommended. If your 10-year fracture risk falls into that intermediate range, 15 to 19.9%, or the T-score is in the osteoporosis range and the age is under 70, uh, pharmacare therapy is suggested because there is intermediate benefit. It means that some people who fall into this group will be treated, but some will not. For the higher risk, highest risk group, anybody whose fracture risk is more than 20% or individuals who are in the osteoporosis range on their bone density and have a, but are uh, more than 70 years old, uh, they're felt to be at highest risk for fracture uh, and treatment is uh, recommended, but so it's expected that most people will get treatment. Included in that group was anybody who's had a hip or spine fracture or anybody who's had um, two or more uh, low trauma osteoporotic fractures. As you move from the low risk group to the intermediate to high risk, the risk gradient goes up and the risk, then the benefit of treatment goes up. In terms of trying to determine who's had a spine fracture, um, imaging is suggested for anybody who's over the age of 65 and has an osteoporotic T-score um, or has an intermediate risk um, uh, between 15 and 19.9%, because if you discover that there is a spine fracture president, present, that will actually increase fracture risk, and those people should be considered for treatment because if you've had a spine fracture that is from osteoporosis, we would say you were high risk. So that is also quite specific in the new guidelines. For people, the, the guidelines for uh, sort of uh, repeating bone density testing have changed too because there's a lot of evidence that frequent bone density testing doesn't change treatment management. Um, so the current recommendations are that if your 10-year risk for a major osteoporotic fracture is less than 10%, uh, you may go as many as 10 years uh, before you have another bone density test. If the risk is in the intermediate range, um, it may be more like five years uh, before you get another test, and three years for people whose uh, risk of fracture is more than 15%. However, those sound like large numbers. Depending on what happens in the interim, a shorter retesting interval may be appropriate for people who have secondary osteoporosis or anyone who develops a new clinical risk factor, for example, a new fracture. So it's not cast in stone that those are the, the time intervals for repeat bone density testing. However, it does mean that you, people should be assessed clinically to determine if an earlier uh, uh, bone density test is recommended or should be considered. So this is the final sort of putting it all together, the final flow chart for when we would consider treatment or not and how we would uh, reassess with bone density testing. Anybody who's started on medication um, 
should be reassessed with bone density testing in three years, unless something intervenes in the interim, in which case you may choose to do it soon. And this is the summary. Uh, just as sort of a final overview, clinical risk factors are important. Um, FRAX is the preferred tool for assessing risk, but KROX certainly can be used. Um, as the fracture risk increases, the benefit of treatment increases, which is why uh, the recommendations are stronger for people who have higher risk uh, for fracture. Um, it's also now strong recommendation to identify people who are uh, uh, have vertebral fractures by doing imaging in a significant group of people. And the interval for repeat bone density assessment is based on the risk assessment um, so that the higher the risk you are, the more frequently you should be having bone density testing. I'm gonna talk now finally about uh, drug recommendations um, for tr and their monitoring of therapy. Um, the first thing, uh, and I alluded to this when we talked about um, uh, the uh, nutrition guidelines, before starting on pharmacotherapy, good practice includes assessing for secondary cause of osteoporosis um, and for potential limitations when considering osteoporosis therapy. So that's looking at people's vitamin D potentially, especially if they um, have risk factors for being vitamin D insufficient. We usually recommend that calcium is checked and your thyroid is checked and your kidney function is checked. We have a number of medications available to use in Canada in 2023. Um, First line, first uh, available for a long time have been bisphosphonates, both uh, oral ones, alendronate and resedronate, and the intravenous bisphosphonate, zoledronic acid. Uh, denosumab, as I said, has been available since 2010. Uh, other options uh, are raloxifene and even hormone replacement therapy. Those are the anti-resorptive drugs, the drugs that are used most commonly because they inhibit um, bones, uh, the, the bone cells that remove bone from uh, remove bone. Um, we also have two bone building therapies, the ones that stimulate new bone formation, um, teriparatide and romazosumab. Uh, romazosumab was certainly not available uh, when the last set of guidelines came out. Older drugs that are no longer available uh, and so are not discussed at all in the guidelines are tedronite or didrical and calcitonin. As many of you know, there have been many challenges with osteoporosis medications. Um, a lot of rare risks uh, with the uh, long-term potent anti-resorptive therapies, uh, atrial, a, atypical femur fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw. The other thing that we've learned a lot about in the last 13 years is uh, risks of stopping denosumab. Uh, if you don't take denosumab uh, as recommended every six months, bone loss occurs very rapidly. And with that bone loss is a risk of spine fractures um, as the bone loss occurs. The other concern is, although we would love to be using them more, the, the cost and the feasibility of using these newer anabolic agents. So when you look at how uh, the recommendations were made for which drugs to use when, they take all of these things into account. It's not that saying that the drugs we recommend first are better or that uh, we haven't considered drugs that are better. It's saying that for most people, um, based on the, the risks and the benefits and the feasibility and the equity, this is the, or this is the recommended order for most people. So pharmacologic intervention is recommended for, or suggested or recommended for individuals who fra whose fracture risk is at least 15% um, and or individuals who, depending on their age, have T-scores in the osteoporosis range. And so when you look at the approach to medication use, we're looking at a number of things, the treatment choice, the treatment duration, um, and the treatment sequence in some circumstances, and monitoring. And monitoring involves uh, not just bone density testing, but monitoring uh, if the drug is tolerable to the individual, if they're taking it correctly, um, uh, if they're having any severe side effects and how they're responding to their. So this is the algorithm or flow chart for starting on therapy. And the red boxes are the actual medications. The gray boxes are uh, sort of uh, monitoring and um, assessing for follow-up. So for most individuals, the first 
choice of therapy would be one of the bisphosphonates, whether it's the oral bisphosphonates or the intravenous. Um, this is based on uh, equity in terms of cost and in terms of feasibility and availability. The recommendation, depending on uh, fracture risk, would be either to be on these medications for three years or up to six years. Um, with reassessment for um, response and for ongoing risk factors for fractures. Um, after th three to six years, the recommendation would be to stop therapy and have a drug holiday, uh, reassessing after three years earlier if there's um, some concern in the interim or individuals have higher risk for fractures, such as a previous hip fracture or a high fracture score. However, not everybody will go on a bisphosphonate. Some individuals have contraindications to bisphosphonates, can't tolerate them. Um, uh, and so in this situation, denosumab would be uh, an alternative therapy. The most important thing with denosumab is a commitment to long-term therapy and understanding that um, once you're on it, you can't just stop it. Uh, and that if you stop it, you have to follow it up with something else. Um, the biggest concern with an awesome app has been what happens if you miss doses um, or, or just stop it uh, without transitioning. So this is why it is considered um, after bisphosphonates for most people. What about the anabolic medications? Uh, it, these medications, there are a number of situations where they may be used, but they may actually be used as first line therapy in individuals who've had uh, severe vertebral fractures, spine fractures, or more than two spine fractures and have a low bone density. Um, these are individuals who will probably see an osteoporosis specialist to get advice about starting either teriparatide or lomazosumab. And it's important to understand that after you've been on these medications, uh, teriparatide is usually two years, lomazosumab is one year. You will need to go on one of the anti-resortives afterwards to sort of um, consolidate the therapy and maintain the benefits that you've had from the drug. Um, we don't, raloxifene is now only recommended for individuals who can't take anything else. It's better than not being on anything at all. And then in terms of monitoring, we recommend re regular assessment, not just with bone density testing, but regular assessment for new fractures or active risk factors such as falls, uh, ongoing monitoring to make sure uh, treatment is being taken properly and that there aren't any adverse effects. Uh, it also includes counseling individuals and, and monitoring for side effects such as atypical femur fracture and osteonecrosis of the jaw. We know that there are a number of risk factors for atypical femur fracture, including being on steroids, being on treatment longer, um, and in uh, those who have an Asian ethnicity. Uh, the risk, the sort of the the signs include having unexplained thigh or groin pain. And so that's something that should be asked about in people who are on uh, any resort to therapy. For osteonecrosis of the jaw, poor dental health and invasive dental surgery and steroid use are risk factors and should be evaluated by a dentist um, if there is any concern that this has happened. So in summary for pharmacotherapy, um, bisphosphonates are considered to be first line, usually for three to six years. Uh, after which there may be a drug holiday, but then you may restart therapy after a drug holiday. Uh, it's hoped that this might encourage more people to take therapy if it's for a shorter time. Denosumab is an alternative option for people who are committed to long-term therapy, uh, but can, must be uninterrupted, and then it has to be transitioned off if there is consideration of discontinuing it. Anabolic agents may be used up front for selected patients, and there's greatest benefit for those at highest risk, particularly recent vertebral fractures. Uh, there's a lot of information, uh, recommendations on monitoring, making sure that people are uh, tolerating therapy, that they are, are not looking for new risk factors and for adherence, as well, as well as recommending bone density testing and fracture risk in three years earlier if there are any new causes of or risks for osteoporosis, new fractures, or other conditions. And with that, I'm going to leave some time for questions. I want to thank, again, the people who provided me with some of the slides for this, um, uh, the, the, um, from each of the fracture, each of the um, working groups, and from the patient representative. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I think Carrie has some questions. <laughs>
Yeah, we thank, thanks, Rowena. That that was great. Um, thanks for providing so much information. Um, there is a link to the clinical practice guideline on our website. If if people want to read things in detail, it can be found there. So now we'll turn to um, uh, some questions and um, let's get started. So first question I have here is, should my husband who is 78 have a bone mineral density test? I think the answer to that is absolutely. If he hasn't already had one, anybody at the age of 78 should be getting a bone density test if they haven't had one before. Okay. Um, are there new metrics? No, I'm sorry. Are there some of the lesser known risks for osteoporosis? I'm sorry, what are some of the lesser known risks for osteoporosis? So we talk, I mean, I put up a slide that had tons of things. We know that there are so many conditions that can, that can um, increase your risk for osteoporosis. Um, drugs besides steroids, certainly cancer drugs, uh, either what they call aromatase inhibitors or androgen deprivation therapy used for breast cancer or prostate cancer. People with um, inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease, people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, individuals who um, have eating disorders or, uh, or um, a number of hematologic conditions, people with parathyroid disease or Cushing's disease or hyperthyroidism. Um, these are all, all there are many of the sort of less common conditions that can contribute to osteoporosis, but the list is much larger than that. Okay. We, we've had a lot of questions about, about uh, nutrition. So I'm just going to do sort of an umbrella question for you. Um, is it possible to get enough calcium from your diet? Okay. I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but absolutely it is possible. It's difficult if you don't have a lot of dairy because the things that are high in calcium are mostly dairy. So a glass of milk would have about 300 milligrams of calcium. A yogurt, I mean, it depends on the size, but maybe, you know, a tub of yogurt may have closer to 200, depending on the amount of yogurt you have um, at a time. So somebody who's drinking two glasses of milk a day, when you start to add in all the other things, will probably get, uh, be able to get all of their um, calcium through diet. Uh, if you don't really have a lot of dairy, it's pretty difficult to do it. But I would recommend going and using the calculator um, to see uh, how much calcium there is. If people always talk about uh, items like broccoli or nuts, and you can see you have to eat a very big bowl of broccoli to get 300 milligrams of calcium. But if you start looking at all the, the things that you eat, you may well be getting 300, 400, 500 milligrams of calcium if you have a very balanced diet uh, and may come close to getting your requirements from, from diet alone. Okay, uh, we'll have two more questions. Um... This question is, is whole body vibration good for osteoporosis? There have been a number of studies looking at it, but to date we don't have any uh, really good evidence that, that it is of benefit. So it isn't, you know, it isn't recommended as something to help osteoporosis. I can't say it, it we have no evidence that it hurts, uh, but there are, aren't any strong data to support its use right now. Okay. And this is our last question. Do medications prevent fractures from falls? So all of the studies looking at osteoporosis medications uh, look at how, how sort of the, how fractures are prevented. Um, the, most of the fractures that occur are as a result of falls. Uh, in general, medications reduce fracture risk by about 30 to 50%, and that would be uh, as a result of falls primarily. Very few fractures occur without a fall. The ones that tend to occur without a fall are usually the spine fractures and medications help reduce those too. Okay, we could go on and on, but we're going to have to conclude things. So I, at this point, I would like to say thanks again to Rowena for a very informative presentation on the new guideline. Uh, for more information on osteoporosis, please visit our website at osteoporosis.ca. There you will find many tools, including our calcium, calcium calculator, uh, podcasts, quizzes, and a repository of past webinars. This webinar will be joining that group uh, shortly. So again, thanks to all of you for joining us today and wishing you a great day ahead. Thank you.